welcome to worship this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Pastor Jean Arlia Erickson, and it is a blessing and a privilege to welcome you to worship today. If you're new or visiting for the first time, we'd like to especially welcome you. Please let myself or one of the worship leaders or one of the ushers know if there's anything we can do to support you while you're here. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements. First of all, um, a thank you to everyone who participated in the cleanup day. You are welcome to stand if you want to be recognized. There was a lot of great work that was done. And you'll notice that the air smells just ever so slightly sweet of cleaning fluid in the nursery and all these different places. So it is wonderful. It is clean and it is ready for VBS. We are very excited. Um, and speaking of VBS, I don't want to steal Judy's thunder, but I want to let you all know that right after worship, we need your help because we are on an exciting journey next week to welcome how many children now? Is it approximately 60, approximately 60 children into our worship space? This is a very exciting time. Always a wonderful time for the church to be able to outreach the community with so many volunteers and so many kids. So this is fantastic. So we have to pray and um, absolutely lift up the folks for VBS and we will be doing a blessing today. But yes, decorating after worship. And Deb will be the worship leader this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am not boot. <laughs> I am pinch hitting. Um, do we have any other announcements this morning? Yes, Helen. Yes, Helen. Morning. After your VBS, the first day of VBS tomorrow, uh, we have a fundraiser at Five Guys. Again, you do not need to present anything. You just go in. And anything after 4 or 10 o'clock, there's a percentage of the proceeds to come back to the church. It's one of the easiest fundraisers we, we run, and the Five Guys folks have been really generous with us. So if we could you know, bring this back to them, that would be great. It's an easy dinner for the summer. Salted caramel milkshake? Phenomenal. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. Yes. Any other announcements? Yep. There is an SPRC meeting also after church today, so if you are an SPRC member, please, uh, it won't be long, but we do need you there. Anything else, folks? Okay, let's rise and greet each other in the sign of peace.
We trust in you, O oh God, for, for you are faithful. Show us your ways and teach us your paths. We wait for you. Lead us in your paths of truth. You are faithful, O oh God. Your love is steadfast. We lift up our souls to you and praise you always. Our opening prayer. Dear Lord, Help us to bring light into all the darkness of life, spreading hope for a better world. Help us to bring salt into the blandness of life, encouraging vitality and joy in living in a world that dares to hope. Hope for the future that you promise. In your son's holy name we pray, amen. amen. Our opening hymn is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It can be found in the red hymnal, number 110, verses one, two, and four. So friends, as we mentioned, uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. And so um, I'd like to uh, make sure that we bless everyone who is going to be involved in VBS. So um, <coughs> friends, if you could just stand where you are um, while we uh, all together lay hands from the congregation and from up here. Uh, so if you're involved in Vacation Bible School, if you're a teacher, if you're a director, if you're helping out, if you're uh, going to welcome people, whatever your involvement is, please rise. This is so exciting, such a large amount of folks. Yes, those of you who are sitting know that you will be targeted. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much. We really appreciate everyone's support and everyone who, who gave water and different things. We so appreciate it and the prayers. Friends, let's raise up a prayer and blessing. 
Loving God, you have entrusted us with the message of your power, grace, justice, and love. We ask for your guidance that we may be teachers and learners together. Believing that you are in our midst, we set apart those who would serve in our vacation Bible school. May they serve you in nurturing the spiritual growth of all who are entrusted in their care. Bless each one gathered here, enabling them to be channels of your grace. We pray all these things through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 Please be seated. And I really do want to mention there is so much work that goes into VBS, not only the week of, but all the prep. And I, I want to raise up uh, Judy DeToma, uh, Lindsay, and Alice. Everyone put in so much prep, and, and all, also all of the teachers and all of the leaders. And Camille, um, absolutely, Camille's been uh, essential helping us do all of the um, uh, the spreadsheets and the, all the different things that go into it. So, so many, um, so many folks have put in a lot of hours. So, uh, we celebrate this really exciting ministry that we do every year. So, in lieu of children's time this morning, um, we know that the youth uh, just came back from their mission trip, and today we're going to welcome them up to give a little bit of an update on what happened, although they will probably do a longer presentation during Children's Sabbath. But uh, they had an amazing time, and they're going to tell you about it. Come on, you. Welcome, Alice. I don't feel my morning voice is there yet. Um, we had a wonderful time. Um, we went over to Reading, Pennsylvania with a group called Little Acts of Love. And the organization sets up people from low-income families who need home improvement projects done in their homes, but they aren't financially able to do it themselves, to hire other, other people to do it, or physically able to do it themselves. So we had joined up with the U, uh, UMC in Hillsdale, they had a group of about um, 15, and altogether there were uh, six adults and 12 teens, and it was a wonderful time together. We split up into three different work groups. We worked at five different homes, um, doing all the different kinds of projects. There was a lot of spackling, a lot of painting. Um, and overall, a lot of being uncomfortable, stepping out of our comfort zone, doing things that we've never done before. Uh, even though we were doing a lot of work there, a lot of the time we spent talking to the homeowners and just being God's presence with them. Um, one of my stories, and I'm gonna invite uh, Ali and John to share some of their stories, but one of my stories uh, was that in the work group that I was with, we showed up um, in the morning and we knocked on the door and we just found out the homeowner's sister had passed the night before. And as a group, we knew that God put us there for that reason, to be God's presence of love and comfort, to sit there and listen to her. Um, that was more of the work that we were there, uh, there to do that day. God had us there to just be there for her as she was grieving <coughs> over her sister. And we're so thankful that we could um, share God's love with others in this way. So you guys want to share? So I was placed in a group with only kids from Hillsdale, and that in itself was very uncomfortable. I had to sleep in a room with someone I didn't know. I had to be in a dormitory with only kids from Hillsdale, and I was just surrounded by people I didn't really know, and go out two hours and work with them and live with them for six days. So that itself was very uncomfortable, but the people there were absolutely lovely. All, everyone my age and just the adults were amazingly nice to us. They were happy to have us even though there was only three of us and they all welcomed us, welcomed us pretty well even though most of, even though the both of us, me and Jonathan, were pretty shy to everyone <laughs> there. And I worked with um, a woman called Mrs. Garcia and she wasn't financially or physically capable to work on her house. And when we, when we first go over to go over to the house to work on them. They don't know us. They don't know their names. We don't even know them. They just sort of have to open up their homes to us and let us work on them. And it's so, and Mrs. Garcia herself wasn't, she didn't really like help. She herself was sort of solitude 
and within just the first day or two, she opened up to me and another woman called Josie, and she was sharing all about her life, and she told us how she doesn't really talk. She lived in the neighborhood for six years, but she just doesn't really talk to anyone because she's afraid of her neighbors. And even just, and we, made, we worked on her house for five days, and honestly, by the last day, it was really tough because she had, she, ha she was forced to put herself in an uncomfortable situation, but by the end, she really didn't want us to leave, and we didn't want to leave her. And the last day, we worked with, um, all of us got together and worked with this um, World War II veteran. His name was Mr. Barry. And despite the fact he was 93 or 94, he was really physically capable. He didn't really want, he was very happy just to have us there. He, his wife had passed away a good 10 years ago and he was lonely so to just have us and the youth just there all like 10 to 15 of us just sitting there having lunch on his lawn made him really happy and even though technically what we did wasn't really big all we did was painting which was a lot of the work it really meant a lot to the people that we helped out and it may not be technically big work but it was more bonding with the people that really really made this trip really amazing. Jonathan, I was put in an entire group of girls, which was also uncomfortable. <laughs> and so the first lady who we helped, um, her name was Lucy. She was um, living by herself with a caretaker that lived a um, good few blocks away. And a cat that roams around the neighborhood that was extremely <laughs> fat. <laughs> so... When we went to her house, we, um, she, had, she oh my God. When we went to her house, we helped her paint her, um, rail, which was a test because it had a lot of curls in the thing, because it was like one of those fancy rails, so we had to like, in the thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so after we helped her with that, um, Oh uh, yeah, so um, the town, her nickname, around the town her nickname was Lollipop Lucy because every time anyone visited, uh, she would always give them a lollipop. Um, second lady we helped, um, she was by herself taking care of her disabled son and, son and another, um, and we helped her with another group, uh, help paint her poor porch in the back, which was a task, and help, yes, it was a large porch, and we also helped paint the ramp in front. Oh. The only thing I really enjoyed was, um... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get put in too much uncomfortable stances because although I, since me and Ollie were the only two um, from UMC, um, I got a room to myself, <laughs> <laughs> which was nice, but yeah, I feel like I got to bond with the uh, kids over in the uh, UMC Hillsdale a lot, and yeah. I can't think well. of So overall, the kids, um, as you can see, uh, they, did, they did a lot of things over the week, and um, they met other teens, they connected, they made connections with each other as well as with the homers that we were serving, and um, I think the, the takeaway, the great big takeaway, was that with just a little bit of kindness, 
you can really change somebody's world. Thank you. Their nursery today? No. No. Okay. Oh. Chico, play Jesus loves. Jesus loves. Jesus loves. Testament reading comes from Jeremiah 23, 23 through 29. I am a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off. Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fall heaven? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophecy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet, sorry, let the prophet who has his dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? It is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like the hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. And our New Testament reading comes from Hebrews eleven twenty nine and 12, 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were a dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. Looking to Jesus and the pioneer of the perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him has endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Our New Testament Gospel reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. So I feel like recently watching TV, the stations have been inundated with these uh, shows about chefs and chefs competing with one another and cooking and all these different things. And it got me thinking, you know, it's interesting when you see like an episode of Chopped and they give you these ingredients and you have to make something out of these ingredients. Um, what particular spices the chefs choose to use is always interesting. So let me ask the chefs in the congregation, just call out, what are some of your favorite spices to cook with? Garlic, Garlic. Garlic basil, okay. oregano, Sage, nutmeg, rosemary, rosemary. Oh, Himalayan. Okay. Himalayan salt. Yes, that's the pink stuff. It's good. Sage, Sage. thyme, yes. Any others? 
Season salt, yes. Cumin. Really good. Cumin. I like curry myself. I'm a big fan. But you know what's almost universal? Um, almost in every single dish, and I, I was, it blew me out of the water because I realized this during my pregnancy when salt was something that I had to be very mindful of. Salt. Salt is in everything. It is in absolutely everything. And there are very few things when you're cooking that salt does not make better. Now granted, we're not talking about an overabundance of salt, but salt certainly brings out the flavor in food. So of all these wonderful spices, this one particular, I guess I'll call it a spice, but seasoning, uh, is absolutely almost essential to cooking. So sodium chloride, it's quite amazing. The very same salt in our kitchens throughout time has wielded the power to transform economies, to make or break dynasties, and it also made sure that our ancestors were able to survive. So salt is actually pivotal in the history of the world. In his book, Salt, A World History, Arthur Mark Kurlansky explores how this substance has been absolutely essential for the world. The word salary actually comes from the Latin word for salt because the Roman legions were sometimes paid in salt. It was such a highly sought after commodity. And while people have, been used, have used canning and artificial refrigeration to preserve food, for, for probably the last hundred years or so, salt has been the best known food preservative, especially for meat, for thousands of years. There is more salt in animal tissues such as meat, blood, and milk than there are plant in plant tissues. And with the spread of civilization, salt became one of the world's main trading commodities. Now, you know, as human beings, we need a certain amount of salt in our bodies to make sure that our body chemistry is in order. If you drink too much water, your cells won't be able to function properly. It was of high value to the ancient Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Hittites, and other peoples of antiquity. In the Middle East, salt was used to ceremonially seal an agreement, and the ancient Hebrews made a covenant of salt with God and sprinkled salt on their offerings to show their trust in God. And for those of you who are military history fans, an ancient practice in time of war was salting the earth actually scattering salt around in a defeated city in order to prevent plant growth. Wars have been fought over salt. Venice fought and won a war with Genoa over the product, and it played an important part in the American Revolution. In 1930, Mahatma Gandhi led at least 100,000 people on the Dandy March, or the Salt Satyagraha, in which protesters made their own salt from the sea and defied British rule to avoid paying the salt tax. So a summary of salt. It's essential to the human body to maintain life. It tastes really good in food. It's essential to the ancient world as a food preservative, a seasoning, a dietary supplement for medicine, and also for art and artisanal uses in fabric. The list goes on and on. And it was also used by God's people, especially in the Old Testament, for a variety of ritual purposes, for salting sacrifices and salting the earth. So it was an important commodity. In today's scripture, Jesus tells his followers that they are salt of the earth. So essentially, Jesus affirmed the value and the importance of his disciples. The saltiness that defined who these disciples were had the power to spread or not spread the word of God. Their gifts and talents, their properties, who they were. All these pieces were essential in order to ensure survival of the gospel and the spreading of God's word. Now in the same scripture, Jesus also calls these same disciples light of the world, light of the world. So in order to fully appreciate how Jesus was referring to us, we first have to talk about and fully appreciate what light is and what it is not. <clears throat> Today, our days are so lit up by the lights on the streets and TV and computer screens and phone screens. Lights are everywhere. And everything is lit up so much that I think sometimes we start to take light for granted. 
but the people who lived many, many years ago, not having the commodity of modern day electricity, lived ultimately in darkness and by the light of day during the day. They knew well how to appreciate light and what it meant just as much as they knew how blind the darkness made them and how it can paralyze function. To those people, darkness was almost like the plague. They knew well that darkness is life under the shadow of death. For Christians, the answer to what light is is not so much a what, but a who. Jesus is our light. He is the light of the world. We must be clear that we are not the source of God's light, but we reflect God's light, just like the moon reflects the sun's. And as such, we are God's light in the world. I think it's really important to remember, as we're talking about these issues of light and dark, um, many of you lived through and watched Hurricane Sandy, and I know uh, folks were affected up here. We had about two, two and a half weeks with no electricity, and it was a whole different relationship with light, with dark, with cooking, with everything. Uh, but it truly, when you go outside and you see even the most recent big blackout in New York, and huge chunks of that, those streets were dark, were dark. It's unnerving to us. We're so used to being able to flip a switch. So I think that's a really important piece that Jesus was talking from. There was no electricity as he's saying this. So if you're light to the world, it's metaphorically, but realistically, people are seeing the light that God has given you. And he's using this perfect analogy to say that you basically light up a room as Christians. That's what our role is, is to bring light to the darkness, just like a candle would bring light in the midst of a dark room. So Jesus helps us see our way to God, and he shows us how to walk along that way in the world. We as believers are to reflect or to witness God's light in the world, and thus magnifying God's light. And without light, we are literally in the dark. Contemporary writer and theologian Anne Lamott wrote a very interesting book called Learning to Walk in the Dark. It's a great book. It was an exploration of light and the lack of it and how much it truly touches our lives. Very important piece uh, to take away. One of the experiments she does is she goes to this, they have an experience in, um, I believe it's Georgia, and it's for folks who have sight to um, experience what it would be like to be absolutely blind. And uh, they, take a, they blindfold you, and you get a guide who is blind, and they take you through different rooms and under uh, different obstacles and different things, and it lasts maybe about a couple of hours. And afterwards, people have incredible experiences not only with the experience of being in the dark, but being able to call upon their other senses and summoning them and how they take over and what that looks like. So it was a very interesting, it's a great book, and it, it talks about this duality of light and dark and um, the importance of light in the world in which we live. So very important. Without electricity, we struggle. Salt and light, are two spiritual building blocks for Christianity. Without either one of these substances, salt or light, we really could not survive. Have you ever eaten unsalted pretzels or potato chips? Yeah, yeah, usually you're not a repeat buyer. Um, this was, I don't recommend, uh, but we tried to find all kinds of different things to, to do with stuff during my pregnancy. I had this whole bag of unsalted pretzels. It's still there. <laughs> you can try salt substitutes like Mrs. Dash, but truthfully, nothing really takes the place of salt. You either have it or you don't. Many believers blend into the world and sometimes pull back on actually showing their salt. But if we lose our distinctive saltiness, we can't really reflect God's love in the way that we would like. Jesus teaches us that just as salt flavors and preserves food, we are to preserve the good in the world, to help keep it from spoiling, and to bring a new and healthy and delectable flavor to life. 
And light quite literally helps us to see. It brightens our path. It helps us to survive and thrive in the world. Being salty and being light is not easy. Often it requires planning, willing sacrifice, and commitment, commitment to Christ, commitment to our faith journeys. But we must know when we lose the desire to be salt and light and share that with the earth, we aren't able to fulfill God's plan. So really important message, and I preached a little bit about this. This passage came up from the Gospel of John, I wanna say uh, a few months ago. But we need to remember what are some of the things that keep us salty? What are the things that keep us filled with light? So the things that keep us salty, coming to church, hearing God's word, Bible study, being in fellowship with one another, performing acts of mission and being actively engaged in the world, and also encouraging one another and building each other up. Because faith is not easy. Faith for the long run, it's not an easy road. There are bumps, there are hurdles, there are broken pieces, and we need to be able to encourage each other, especially when times are difficult. Light. We get our light, the light that makes us Christian, the light that radiates God's love from the Lord. So the more time we spend being in the presence of God, thinking about God, maybe doing devotional, maybe being in prayer, the more we're able to radiate that light because we're filled with God's holy light. So think about that. When I was a kid, we used to have these, um, I think they're the glow necklaces, and you would recharge them. I remember being a kid and taking the lampshade off and holding them up to the light bulb. That's, that was one of the ways that you recharge them. So in the same way that we did that as kids, when we stand beneath God's presence and we channel, we want to connect with God, we are filling ourselves with God's light. We are recharging ourselves. That's a really important image to call to mind. Next time you pray, think about that. Think about filling your body with God's light and love. Friends, without us, without our gifts, people who don't know the gospel will remain in darkness. God needs each of us to be a light. Let us remember to immerse ourselves in the sun's light so we might radiate that light to others. And let us remember to keep ourselves salty so that we and others can experience a rich and robust faith. Amen. Amen. Friends, at this time, I invite you, if you're able, to please rise and join with me in the next hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. That's number 133, verses 1 and 3. <coughs> Thanksgiving together. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift we up the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Age after age, you have revealed yourself to your people and blessed them with gifts beyond number. They planted and watered, but you gave the growth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their ending hymn, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us join our voices together in singing the Lord's Prayer.
Prayer. I received several prayer requests, which I will share with you. Um, I have prayers for. Uh, Larry Persaud, this is given by Donna, that all goes well with his chemotherapy. So prayers of healing for Larry. And also for Michael Stewart, for strength, courage, safety as he leaves for boot camp in the United States Army National Guard Military Police. And that's requested by his family. And we're going to do a special blessing of Michael after we pray today, but yes. Absolutely, all the sick and the shut-ins. We will continue to keep them in our loving prayers. Any other prayers that we'd like to lift up? Also, yes, Naomi. Prayers on Wednesday for Naomi's surgery for her hip. So prayers of healing, and we just ask God to be with you and the doctors every step of the way and promote healing and a full recovery. Um, also, please continue prayers for my father. Friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you on this day as we have on many other days to give you thanks for so many things and to express our appreciation for being in fellowship with you in this community of faith. We are part of each other and rejoice in this belongingness. We need you and your presence not only at this moment, but throughout the week before we gather again in your name. We are thankful for your love and grace and give thanks for the many joys you bring into our lives. We also, Lord, raise up our prayers of concern and please know even those that we speak just in our own hearts, we know you hear. But among those prayers of concern, we lift up Larry and we lift up Michael and we lift up Naomi our church and its ministries, our active military veterans and their families, 
our first responders, the homeless and those who lost their jobs, our sick and our shut-ins, our homebound members, including Charlotte, continued prayers for Myrna Richards and her family on the passing of her son-in-law, prayers for the family of Gwen Morrison, prayers for Peggy, for Carlene, for Naomi, for Johnny Johnson, for Kristen and McKee, for Joan, Michael, Amy, Doris, Jim, Adeline, Lisa, Joanne, Jack, Rose, Ed, Michael, Jim, Marilee, Tom, Alex, Teresa, Margaret, Alan, Roger, Winnie, Ginny and her family, Tony, Kathy, Jerry, Cheryl, and Joan. Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you, knowing that you hear every single one. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, we do have a special blessing before we go into our offering. Um, I'd like to invite Michael and Deb and anyone who feels especially close to Michael's faith journey, I want to invite you. Michael, is it okay if they lay hands on you? Oh. Michael, can you kneel? to give you a minute. Are you good for the opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> Friends, at this time, we have the opportunity to lift up our lives, our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings, and our ushers will wait upon you.
Friends, our closing hymn is God Will Take Care of You. That's number 130 in your hymnals, verses 1, 3, and 4.